Hi everybody. Today is Friday, March 29th. And instead of doing our typical practice, which we have done all throughout the season of Lent, which is to gather at noon to say the Lord's Prayer, today I invite you to join us for a relatively brief Holy Week meditation guide. My dear beloved friend Bobby Strickland painted some paintings years ago um, as a way for us to process, think, and consider, and visualize what it was like for Jesus to walk through his last days. So today on Good Friday, it is our goal and opportunity to stop and pause and reflect in awe of what Jesus is willing to do for us. And keep in mind, of course, this is God in Christ. This is God, the creator of all things, who has said to us, I will come and be with you and suffer alongside you. And so this story of suffering is not one that is done frivolously. It's not one that is offered as a father asking a child. No, this is God incarnate saying, I will come and experience the most difficult parts of life with you so that there will never be anything that you endure or go through that you do not experience without me. This is why we understand Jesus' act on the cross to be salvific, why we understand that God was willing to die for us so that we may live and have eternal life. So today I invite you to pause and I'm going to uh, use a, um, I'm going to use the artwork and there will be a few slides before the artwork. I'm using PowerPoint so this may be a little awkward in our uh, live streaming platform but we'll see how it works. Um, one of them will indicate that you can gather some items to have near you if they are helpful for you. If, they're, um, if you're a tactile person, you might want to have a, some of these things around just to utilize while you're thinking and praying and meditating on the art. So I would like to switch over to that. So you will not be seeing me. You'll hear my voice, but you won't see my face. Um, I invite you to pause for just a moment uh, for the next several minutes and let us consider the good that God has done through the most horrible act that humanity has ever committed. Even in that, there can be life. You may find these things helpful at each station or each slide, you may want to have a Bible, a sign, a candle, and a painting. Those, those will be provided for you. Uh, but you may want to have a cloth or a bag of coins. Maybe if you've got a palm or a plant nearby, something sharp that represents the crown of thorns, a purple cloth, a crucifix or a cross or something wooden that you can hold. If you're really feeling it, you can get a piece of wood with some hammer and nails pair of dice. Have some space to pray and maybe have a piece of white or black or any color cloth really would do. Last, if you happen to have any oil, uh, some of you may have some anointing oil or even if you've got massage oil or something that you use um, to soothe you, uh, bring that around, have that on hand. My friends, welcome to the guided meditation for Good Friday. This meditation will give you an intimate look at the last hours of Jesus' life. Yes, we are busy people, and these are busy times, and I'm so glad that you're here and that you've taken the time to be in this sacred space. Today, we are going on a journey, and at each station, you will encounter a text which describes what Jesus did during Holy Week. As you make your way through, I invite you to reflect on the text. As you leave the tomb, the final place in our journey today, you will have opportunities to think about how the text might affect you in the here and now. What does the text mean for the Christian life today? What does it mean for your life? Keep in mind that we live in a world where time is based on linear thinking. We know of life as past, present, and future. But the God of all who created us to live in this world is not bound by time. So the events of Holy Week are not bound by history. 
The events of Holy Week recur each year as if they are happening all over again. There's no need to rush. The goal is to think about the text as if hearing it for the first time, and then think about its meaning for your life today. This requires listening deeply and reflecting vulnerably. Take as much time as you need and give others the time and space they need as well. Relax. Breathe deeply. Our journey begins with the Monday of Holy Week, on the day following Palm Sunday. In our first text, commonly referred to as the cleansing of the temple, Jesus enters the temple courtyard and seeing the business going on there, begins to drive out those who are buying and selling, and he overturns the tables of the money changers. He interrupts the temple activity because it had become a substitute for the activity of justice and righteousness which God commands. What Jesus did in the cleansing of the temple was an interruption. An interruption of the normal day-to-day way of doing things. It might have been a holy interruption, but it was an interruption nonetheless. An interruption. Keep that word in mind as you begin. It will be important. Interruption. When you feel ready, take a deep breath and remember that this is a sacred space and a sacred time. Blessings on your journey. Station one. Jesus cleanses the temple. Then they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple and he overturned the temples of the money changers, the tables of the money changers, and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. If you wish, close your eyes and imagine the scene. Business as usual. Then the violence of Jesus' anger. The shock of onlookers. Pause with the scene for just a moment and let it unfold in your imagination. What in our world the church, your own life, makes Christ this angry right now. Invite God into the place where you hold these thoughts, images, and feelings in your heart. This is your chance to give these things over to God and let God be angry with you and for you. Here in the courtyard, I invite you to overturn the tables of the things that have set up camp in your lives and in your hearts. Smash them, break them, let them go. Watch as the good intentions that have turned into bad habits and misguided actions are turned on their heads. Station two, Jesus prays in Gethsemane. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake even one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. 
he came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up! Let us get going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus came to the garden to pray. Here in this quiet space, I invite you to focus on this painting of Christ. Look at his expression. What do you see? As you read the scripture, how does it make you feel to know that Jesus was distressed, agitated? What is he asking of the disciples? Why can't they seem to do it? How does it make you feel? that Jesus prayed for the hour to pass from him. Let this be your prayer as you sit and contemplate. Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Station three. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed and spat upon him. They knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. Here, perhaps you can have some scraps of purple cloth, something sharp like a crown of thorns. I invite you to touch the sharpness and feel how sharp it is. Run your hands over the soft fabric. The actions of the soldiers were humiliating and scornful, and yet during this Holy Week, the mocking and derision still pointed to the truth of the gospel, that Jesus is the King of the Jews, the Lord of life, the Son of God and the Son of Man. What do you find that you mock or deride in your own life? A person, a relationship, a job? Consider why you have such deep feelings and seek to discover why. Are you afraid? Are you afraid of love? of success, of failure. Frequently, we mock what we most desire, and what we desire most is to be loved. Yet to receive love is often the most challenging thing for us. So we hurt love. We hold it at a distance. We scorn it and question it and wait for love to leave. Jesus came that we may know the fullness of God's love. Like the soldiers, we deny that love because it is too powerful, too mysterious, too overwhelming. We flood our minds with doubt. We place a thorny crown on the head of that which we most desire. But for God, nothing we do will separate us from God's love. As you sit, open yourself to the possibility that God's love does not have to be scorned or mocked, but can be accepted. Station four. The soldiers compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry the cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. We know very little of Simon of Cyrene, except he was the one chosen to carry the cross for Jesus. He was willing, able, weighted down. Imagine the cross that we use on Sunday mornings during worship. Imagine the weight of it in your hands and watch how it pulls you forward. The force of gravity that makes you want to put it down. As you feel the heaviness of the cross, consider the weight of the cross upon which Christ was crucified. It was massive, made of hewn logs that weren't hollowed or sanded. And not only was it heavy, it was rough and abrasive. 
When you are called by Jesus to take up your cross, what do you imagine lifting? What in your life is so heavy and burdensome that you crave and desire help to carry it? Who in your life might need help with their cross? Is there someone who is struggling who could use your strength and comfort? Now, consider what sort of cross Jesus is calling you to carry as you follow him. What makes being a Christian hard for you? What do you struggle with the most? As you consider the cross, ask Jesus where you are being led. Consider picking up your burden and following where Christ is calling you to go. Station 5 A great number of people followed him, and among them were the women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to Golgotha, the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And they crucified Jesus there with the criminals. It's horrible. Those eight words contain the greatest sin that humankind ever committed. We crucified Jesus, the Son of God, the embodiment of love, our Savior, God incarnate. Here, perhaps you have a hammer and nails. You are invited to hammer an, a nail carefully into a piece of wood. Hear the ring of the hammer, the echo of its force. What have we done, O Lord? And yet Jesus' first words are, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Pray for forgiveness for the things in your life that you find most unforgivable. God is willing, if we but ask. Station 6 when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now, the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes amongst themselves, and for my clothing they cast. And this is what the soldiers did. Here, perhaps, you have a set of dice. As you read the poem, hold the dice in your hands and roll them around. Before Jesus died, the soldiers took charge and let him out. Just politics, they said. And suddenly there they were, the skull, the horrid mount, stripped, naked. He refused the anesthesia and was pounded into wood. Gambling, laughing, cursing, mocking, weeping, hoping, praying. A casino at the cross. A casino at the cross. What do we gamble on today? We can take things that are so trivial and give them power and value when they have none. A tunic, a simple tunic, gambled away by soldiers at the foot of the cross. This is your chance to take away the power that you have given to arbitrary things. 
to set down the dice and refuse to gamble for something that means nothing. We don't have to take chances with God. We've done our worst and we are still loved and forgiven. Station 7 Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. Jesus has always pushed us to reconsider everything we hold dear, institutions, possessions, and now our family systems. Jesus says to his weeping mother who birthed him, nursed him, fled with him, fed him, taught him, rejoiced with him, lost him, found him. Woman, here is your son. He knows that she is looking at her own flesh and blood in its most vulnerable state. As an infant, she washed his belly and feet and chest and head. She knows him intimately. And here, for all the world to see, is her son, naked, dying, bleeding, wounded, broken. This is a heartbreaking scene. But Jesus says to the disciple with her, here is your mother. In this absurd moment on the cross, Jesus shakes even the bond of family, or so it seems. Perhaps what Jesus is doing is restoring those bonds so that when Mary weeps for her son, she will have another to comfort her. Jesus does not leave her alone or abandoned. He provides a new relationship with the disciple whom he loved. How is it that Jesus has given you hope out of your sorrow? Brought for life where there was death. How is it that a heartbreaking death made place for a new, different relationship to begin? Station 8 When it was noon, Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him, saying, Wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come down and take him. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God? I invite you to take time today to read through Psalm 22. You will see an echo of the words that Jesus shouts from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani. This is how the psalm begins. But listen and be attentive to the tone throughout the psalm. How does it change? Do you see the psalmist moving from one emotion to another? What does Jesus' invocation of these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, tell you about his final moments on the cross? How does it make you feel to think that Jesus felt forsaken by God? Remember that Jesus was wholly divine and wholly human. His death was not divine punishment, but truly God suffered and died as well. 
If you choose, if you have a candle lit, let it burn and then blow it out to signify the darkness of this moment. Station nine. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear, asked Pilate to take him away, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths. According to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. After death, all we can do is mourn. We go through the motions of grieving and preparing and when death makes itself welcome in our lives, we have to accommodate it. At this point, see if you can find your anointing oil and a piece of cloth. I invite you to anoint your head as a reminder that we will meet death ourselves one day, calling back what we practiced on Ash Wednesday. Remember that we are dust and to dust we shall return. Our mortality is always with us and the promise that we receive is that we are not alone, even in death. Today we prepare to bury the body of Jesus. He has been crucified and has died the same death that we will one day face. Give thanks that God loves us even through our own sinfulness and brokenness. God refuses to be without us even in death. I invite you to leave this space and hold it in silence. As you consider all that God has done for you, remember that this death is real.